Welcome class to chapter six. And in this chapter, we'll talk about how cells harvest chemical energy. Um, so what that means is we'll talk about how cells take in the food you eat, for example, and make energy out of it, uh, which is ATP, which is what all of your body needs. Uh, oxygen is extremely important. It's a reactant in cellular respiration, means your bodies need oxygen to create energy. The process of cellular respiration is the process that breaks down sugar and anything else you eat and generates or creates ATP, which is the energy currency in cells, as well as heat. Brown fat cells have a short circuit in their cellular respiration, which generates only heat, not ATP. And in this chapter, we explore the stages of cellular respiration and how cells produce ATP in the presence of oxygen. So when there's oxygen presence. Um, brown fat is important for keeping a newborn warm um, and for helping keep an adult thin later in life. So that's what brown fat is good for. So here's the big ideas. We'll look at cellular respiration, which is how your bodies uh, take in oxygen to create energy, the stages of cellular respiration, a little bit about fermentation, which is uh, the anaerobic harvesting of energy, which means without oxygen and connections between the metabolic pathways. So first, cellular respiration, uh, life requires energy. In almost all ecosystems, energy ultimately comes from the sun. So for example, in photosynthesis, in plant cells, the energy of sunlight is used to rearrange the atoms of carbon dioxide in water to produce organic molecules and releasing oxygen into the atmosphere. And in cellular respiration, oxygen is consumed by animal cells as organic molecules are broken down to carbon dioxide and water as waste, and the cells will capture the energy released as ATP. So here we look at the connection between photosynthesis and cellular respiration. So photosynthesis takes carbon dioxide and water using the sunlight from the sun in photosynthesis, chloroplasts create organic molecules and oxygen. Then animal cells will take in oxygen using um, oxygen, they will create ATP, which powers most of the cellular work. And as a waste product, cellular respiration will release carbon dioxide and water, which will go into plant cells to help create photosynthesis. Respiration is often used as a synonym for breathing, which refers to an exchange of gases. So an organism obtains oxygen from its environment and releases carbon dioxide as you exhale as a waste product. Breathing and cellular respiration are closely related. Um, are in a checkpoint question, are the oxygen atoms a runner exhales the same oxygen atoms she inhaled? Um, and they would be completely different um, because the oxygen that a runner would inhale um, would go directly to cellular respiration. So here's just a connection between breathing and cellular respiration. So the oxygen you breathe in is then transported into the bloodstream to your muscle cells, carrying out uh, cellular respiration, which is the breakdown of glucose and oxygen into carbon dioxide, water, and ATP. And you can see here carbon dioxide and water will leave um, the lungs as you exhale as carbon dioxide and water vapor. So cellular respiration is an exergonic process, meaning it releases energy that transfers energy from glucose to form ATP, and it captures about 34% of the available energy originally stored in glucose with the rest of the energy lost as heat. So here's just a look at a summary equation for the cellular respiration. So glucose refers to any food particle that you eat ultimately gets broken down into a glucose molecule. And the C6H12O6 refers to the numbers of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygen in one single glucose molecule. So when we combine that with oxygen and we go through the stages of cellular respiration, and there's many of them, um, we get out carbon dioxide as a waste product, water as a waste product, and ATP, which is our energy that we want, as well as heat. So your body always requires a continuous supply of energy. Um, cellular respiration provides energy for body maintenance, creating proteins and voluntary activities, and a balance of energy intake and expenditure is required to maintain a healthy weight. 
So this is a look at the energy consumed per hour uh, by a 67 and a half kilogram person doing various activities. Values do not include the kilocals needed for uh, normal body maintenance. So these are any sort of activities um, that would burn um, the kilocal kilocalories that you can see there. So a checkpoint question is, while walking at three miles per hour, how far would you have to travel to burn off the equivalent of an extra slice of pizza, which is about 475 kilocals? Um, how long would that take? And you can see here walking um, is about two, three miles per hour, which is about 245 kilocals. So it would take you um, a little less than two hours to burn off that slice of pizza, which is a little depressing. So keep eating your pizza everything in moderation. That's my advice. So how do your cells extract energy from fuel molecules? And the answer involves the transfer of electrons in chemical reactions. Electrons are always removed from fuel molecules like glucose, and we call that oxidation, and they're transferred to an NAD+. And when we transfer electrons to some sort of molecule like this NADH+, we call that a reduction reaction. NADH passes the electrons onto an electron transport chain. And as electrons fall from carrier to carrier within that train, and finally to oxygen, energy will be released. So this is just a look at the movement of hydrogen atoms with their electrons in the redox reactions of cellular respirations and which ones are losing electrons and which ones are gaining. Here's the oxidation of an organic fuel with the company reduction of NAD to NADH. So you can see here, um, NAD becomes NADH. And when we add on that hydrogen, whenever you add on an atom, you're adding electrons because there needs to be a bond that forms and bonds form with electrons. So we call this a reduction reaction because it's gaining electrons in a form of a bond um, that binds that hydrogen atom to the NADH. So we are reducing that. Electrons releasing energy for ATP synthesis as they fall down an energy staircase from NADH through an electron transport chain to oxygen. So NADH is important for carrying extra electrons that will get sent through this staircase electron transport chain. And as the electrons get sent through the electron transport chain, ATP will eventually be um, created and water will be a byproduct because oxygen is what we call the final electron receptor. So these electrons that are transported through the chain um, have to go somewhere. Oxygens will accept those electrons along with two hydrogen atoms, and then we will create water, which is one of the waste products of cellular respiration. So the stages of cellular respiration, stage one is glycolysis, glycolysis, which occurs in the cytosol of the skull. So just kind of in the fluid outside of the organelles. This begins cellular respiration. And the simple version of glycolysis is that it breaks down glucose into two molecules of a three carbon compound called pyruvate. Stage two then is pyruvate oxidation and the citric acid cycle. So that pyruvate then goes to the mitochondria, which continues the breakdown of glucose into carbon dioxide and supplies the third stage of respiration with electrons. So here's a look at an overview of the three stages of cellular respiration. Glycolysis, which literally means the splitting of glucose into pyruvate happens in the cytosol. And then pyruvate oxidation, the citric acid cycle, um, and the electron transport chain, that all happens in the mitochondria. Um, which is the um, cellular respiration creator of ATP in the cell. So here's the overview again of the three stages of cellular respiration, just a little bit more enlarged. Stage three is oxidative phosphorylation, which is also that electron transport chain and the chemoosmosis. So this is where NADH and a related electron carrier called FADH2 will shuttle electrons to the electron transport chains embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Most of the ATP will be produced by cellular respiration. It's generated by what we call oxidative phosphorylation. And the electrons are finally passed to oxygen, which becomes reduced to water. 
Um, so this is just a good review question. Uh, of the three main stages of cellular respiration, which one does not take place in the mitochondria? And that was glycolysis, stage one. So in stage one, glycolysis harvests chemical energy by oxidizing glucose to pyruvate. So ATP is used to prime the glucose molecule, which is split in two. And these three carbon intermediates will be oxidized again to two molecules of pyruvate, which leads to a net total of two ATP and two NADPH. ATP is formed by what we call substrate level phosphorylation, in which a phosphate group is just transferred or added from an organic molecule to ADP, which is uh, adenosine diphosphate. So here's a look at an overview of glycolysis, stage one of cellular respiration, and a little bit more enlarged there. So taking the six um, carbon molecule glucose and breaking it down into two pyruvates. Here's just a look at the substrate level phosphorylation, which just means um, which we're transferring a phosphate group from ADP uh, to uh, produce ATP. The next figure will show simplified structures for the organic compounds in the nine chemical reactions of glycolysis. The sequential steps of glycolysis will illustrate how in a metabolic pathway, each chemical step will feed into the next. So in other words, the product of one reaction will just serve as the reactant for the next and compounds that form between an initial reactant and a final product are what we call intermediates. The energy investment phase actually consumes energy. And that's because in this glycolysis phase, two molecules of ATP are used to kind of jumpstart the reaction, um, which will then split glucose into two small sugars. So steps one to four consume energy, and then steps five to nine will yield energy. And these are all the steps. Um, you guys don't need to know the exact um, of all nine steps of glycolysis but eventually you should just know that glucose is split into two three carbon intermediates. And I'll let you guys look these through these on your own, but again, I won't ask you specific details. So then we move on to the citric acid cycle, which completes the energy yielding oxidation of organic molecules. So it takes pyruvate and it oxidizes it to yield uh, two acetyl-CoA carbon dioxide and NADH and for each turn of the citric acid cycle, two carbons from acetyl-CoA are added, two carbon dioxides are released, and three NADHs and one FADH2 are produced. And these are important intermediates, which will go on to the third step of cellular respiration because they have the electrons in their bonds uh, to go to the electron transport chain. So here's an overview of pyruvate oxidation and the citric acid cycle and a little bit enlarged shown here, how we get go from pyruvate into acetyl-CoA, so it's being oxidized. And here's the citric acid cycle, um, how acetyl-CoA goes into the citric acid cycle, and there's a shows a series of six major steps of the citric acid cycle. You don't need to know all six steps, but you should know that it is a cycle and acetyl-CoA starts it. Um, and it kind of always starts and ends with the same molecule, which is oxaloacetoacetate. In mitochondria, electrons from NADH and FADH2 will be passed down the electron transport chain to oxygen, which picks up hydrogen to form water. Energy is released by these redox reactions, and it's used to pump hydrogen into the intermembrane space in the mitochondria. This creates a hydrogen gradient, which will drive hydrogen back, hydrogen ions back through the enzyme complex ATP synthase in the inner membrane, which will synthesize ATP. So this is a look at the um, electron transport chain. So this is the outer mitochondria membrane in the inner mitochondria membrane. And what the um, electron transport chain does is electrons are passed through these carriers and when electrons are passed through these protein carriers, hydrogen ions are pumped out to create a gradient, meaning there's more concentrated hydrogen ions here. When that occurs, they'll pass through rapidly what we call ATP synthase, which is a big rotor. 
And when hydrogen atoms pass through this rotor, they'll pop out about 30 ATP um, for every molecule of glucose. So this ATP synthase is incredibly important for creating a lot of glucose. Then when those electrons are done being transport, transported between carriers, they will be attached to oxygen, which will combine with hydrogen to create water as another waste product. So most ATP production occurs by oxidative phosphorylation, again, which is what happens at the ATP synthase. What effect would an absence of oxygen have on the process of oxidative phosphorylation? So without um, oxygen to pull electrons down the electron transport chain, the energy stored in those NADH and FADH could not be harnessed for ATP synthesis. So everyone wants to know why we need oxygen uh, to survive. And that's because without oxygen, your cells will be unable to create energy or ATP um, and you'll die very quickly. Uh, mitochondria in brown fat can burn fuel and produce heat without making ATP. Um, and that's because ion channels spanning the inner mitochondrial membrane allow hydrogen to flow freely across the membrane. This dissipates the hydrogen gradient, which does not allow ATP synthesis to make ATP. And all of the energy from the burning of fuel molecules would then be released as heat. Until recently, brown fat in humans was thought to disappear after infancy, but recent research shows that brown fat may be present in most people when activated by cold, the brown fat of skinny individuals is more active. So here's just a look at the activity level of brown fat um, versus overweight or obese participants. All right. Um, so substrate level phosphorylation and oxidative phosphorylation produces about 32 AT molecules for every glucose molecule. Um, and you should be able to explain where oxygen is used and carbon dioxide is produced in cellular respiration. And again, this is just an estimated tally of the ATP produced per glucose molecule. We get about two from glycolysis, two from citric acid cycle, and we get the most from the oxidative phosphorylation from the electron transport chain to get a total of about 32 ATP produced. Fermentation is then the anaerobic harvesting of energy. Um, fermentation is a way of harvesting energy that does not require oxygen. So under anaerobic condition, muscle cells, yeasts, and certain bacteria can produce ATP by glycolysis, and NADH will be recycled from NADH as pyruvate is reduced to lactate or lactic acid fermentation or alcohol and CO2, which is alcohol fermentation. So here's the lactic acid fermentation and NAD plus is regenerated as pyruvate to be reduced to lactate. Alcohol fermentation, NAD plus will be regenerated again as pyruvate to be broken down to CO2 and ethanol. And here are wine barrels, um, how fermentation is used to produce something tasty as well as beer fermentation. That's not as big of a fan as beer myself. Here's a great animation about fermentation for an overview and then a checkpoint question. Um, if you're still with me and you're listening to this PowerPoint, I'm going to spend the majority of the questions from this lecture just on cellular respiration using oxygen. And I won't ask you too many questions about um, the remainder of the PowerPoint slides, whether that's fermentation or what I cover now. So focus your studying on just those three steps of cellular respiration and that's uh, probably where I'll be normally mostly get the majority of your questions for the test. So glycolysis occurs in the cytosol of the cells of nearly all organisms. Um, this is thought as a theory to have evolved in ancient prokaryotes. And some connections between metabolic pathways, and we'll end the PowerPoint here, you obtain most of your calories as uh, carbohydrates like sucrose and other disaccharides, sugars and starch, fats and proteins. And a cell can use all three of these types of molecules to make ATP. And that's because they can take any food such as peanuts, whether it's a carb, a fat or a protein, and they can break it down into a sugar, which will enter um, the citric, the um, cellular respiration cycle as glucose. Glycerol fatty acids from fats can enter the glycoly glycolysis cycle as G3P, 
and proteins can be broken down into amino acids, which can enter the respiration cycle in a variety of parts. So that's how all of your foods get broken down to enter the cellular respiration cycle um, in various stages, depending on what it is. And this is just an enlarged view of that. Can a human survive on a diet consisting primarily of fats and proteins and almost no sugar? Technically, yes, because fats and proteins can still enter the cellular respiration pathway, um, as you can see here. So fats and proteins can still enter that pathway. Cells use intermediates from cellular respiration and ATP for biosynthesis of other organic molecules, and these metabolic pathways are often regulated by feedback inhibition. So here shows the biosynthesis of other organic molecules from intermediates of cellular respiration. And here's just an enlarged version of that. All right, explain how someone can gain weight and store fat when even on a low fat diet. diet. And that's just because if you take in too many calories, no matter what happens, if your calorie intake um, supersedes your calorie outtake of exercise, you will still gain weight, even if it is incredibly healthy um, alternatives. So from these slides, you should be able to do the following. Um, and again, at the end, you have some diagrams and you should, let's see, this, these are some great diagrams to fill in. Um, if you're still listening, I definitely will probably use some of these diagrams in the test because I think um, it's just an easy way for you to study and for me to test your comprehension. Thanks for listening, guys, and I hope you're all doing well.